All right, let's get into the Word of God. You have your Bibles. Turn with me to Luke, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Um, been under the weather this week. Thank you for your prayers, all your concerns. Uh, many encouraging text messages and care packages, and just thank you so much for your thoughtfulness. Um, if you're there in Luke 15, this is the third parable in this series that Jesus is teaching, uh, and this is our series on the prodigal. Chapter 15, starting with verse 11, the Word of God says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Oh, no, he did it. I want to change the title of this sermon to No, He Did It. Squandered everything on wild living. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for trusting us in this space where we can connect with you. We want to be challenged by your word. We want to be able to see ourselves in the mirror. But more importantly, we want to see you. May that be our reality in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was growing up, I thought that all the father simply did was give his son some money. His son didn't want to wait any longer, and so he gave him money out of his bank account and said, this is what I set aside for you. That's not how it worked in those days. When a parent would pass away, the property would be divided between the siblings. Often the older one would have a greater portion because he had greater responsibility. So in this situation, the estate is divided between the two sons. That seemed pretty cool, but the Bible says that sometime later, he decided that he wanted to cash out. So what used to be the father's property was then sold off to someone else. So the house got a little bit smaller. The front yard got a little smaller. The backyard was a little bit smaller. They lost a few cars, a, loose, a, a few chariots and horses. They lost some cattle because the younger son didn't want to live any longer around his dad. In fact, the message he was sending, and maybe it wasn't intended, but in this culture, it would have been loud and clear. Dad, I cannot wait for you to die. Give me what is mine and let me go. How many parents here would uh, succumb to this kind of demand? How many parents here would be like, that's a reasonable request. We actually don't need four bedrooms. How many of us would acquiesce to our children in this way? Most of us would not. Most of us would believe that it's our responsibility as a parent to put our children in their place. Oh no, you just did it. That's how some of us would say it. Oh, you can leave, but you ain't getting a dime. Good luck. But the father in this story gives up everything only for it to be absolutely wasted. Now, this is where we get the term prodigal. If you can see the definition up there, wasteful, reckless, extravagant, this is why the younger son is called the prodigal son. Not because he's lost, but because he's wasteful with the means that he had. But can I add another layer to this? The father appears to be a bit of a prodigal, right? Is he not also wasteful with his own funds? I mean, come on, parents. We know our kids. We know if our kids leaving the house at 17, 18 years old are going to make it or not. We know if they can cook or not, clean or not. 
We know if they're going to embarrass us or not. That's why some of you are like, just leave and leave far as you can, right? Just go as far as you can. That way I'm not embarrassed when stuff hits the fan. And this is what's really interesting about this story. The father is willing to give up half of his wealth, give it to someone he knows cannot be trusted with it. All for what, fam? All for what? Last week, we talked about this same idea in the message, you lost me. Remember, the woman in the parable represents God, and she's the one that loses the coin. In this parable, God is the one that is depicted as losing us. Isn't it God who kind of, in a sense, wasted all of his glory creating Lucifer? Why would he pour so much into a being that is going to fail and fail miserably? These are these situations that we struggle with. Now, for those of you who say, but pastor, how do you know for sure that God was being too extravagant, maybe being wasteful or irresponsible? Think about this for a second. God, who we believe is perfect and all good, right, and all-knowing, allowed for there to be war in heaven. And not just any kind of war, but a war where God would lose one-third of his creation. One-third of heaven walks out. One-third. I, I don't know about you, but if I were God, there'd be no way there could be war. Like, as soon as you acted up, you out. Like, you're just straight up gone. Like, you're not about to mess with my peace and mess with the universe's peace. But God was so vulnerable, God was so willing, as we learned last week, to be in a relationship with us where there was what? What we say? Likeness. Where there was choice. God wasn't simply creating rocks and leaves God was creating likeness, reflection, and any time you create in love and desire love, you are always setting yourself up for rejection, right? If you're going to get married, there's a possibility for divorce. If you want to have children, there's a possibility of them leaving the house and never coming back. But this is what love requires. Without freedom, there is no love. Without freedom, it is impossible to truly love and to be loved. So God sets up his universe in this way where Lucifer can get all of his glory, get all of his wealth, and walk out if he so chooses. The question I have for you is why? Why would God allow Lucifer to walk out with one-third of heaven? Why would God allow in this parable his child to leave with half of the wealth, knowing it will be squandered. Anybody want to take a guess? Why do you think? To prove a point? Here's the thing that most of us don't understand. If God were to keep Lucifer in his place or to keep one-third of heaven in their place, if the father would have forced his son to stay, the son would have been more lost than if he had left the house. This is where many of us miss the battle. Many of us think that if we can coerce or manipulate or control somebody to love us, to like us, to stay with us, if we can throw enough red books at them and say, let me tell you where I highlighted and underlined all these important truths, that someone will say, you're right, you're right, I was wrong, my bad. How often does that work in disagreements? If you don't stay, well, this is what I'm going to do to myself. God does not manipulate. God, watch this, does not control. How many of us have heard, don't worry, God is in control? How many times have we heard this? How comforting is that? It's comforting. Don't worry, God is in control. You have cancer? Don't worry, God is in control. Don't worry, God is in control. Don't worry. God, are you ready, is not in 
control. If God was in control, there would be no sin. Right? If God was in control, there'd be no rebellion, right? If God was in control, there'd be no murder, right? God is not in control. He's relinquished control or choice to us. Now, God does have boundaries, but God is not controlling. And this is really important because often people will attribute things that are happening in this world to God. And God is like, I didn't make that choice. So God understands something that we don't understand. And because he sees the big picture, he realizes keeping Lucifer in his place or in the parable, the father keeping the son in his place would only create more damage and more distrust. So he lets him go. All right, son. Have it all. The Bible says in verse 14 in Luke, Chapter 15, it says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to, uh, to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. It's a pretty bad situation to be in. He was the talk of the town when he came in with all that money. Everybody wanted to be his best friend. But now that he has nothing, no one is there to help him out. But that's what happens in famines. I'm not going to be too hard on the citizens. Everybody's looking out for themselves. So this man has really fallen on some tough times. And then in verse 17, it says, when he came to his senses. Let me pause there. Can I pause there for a little bit? Let me pause there for a little bit. Everybody wants to give the young man credit for coming to his senses. I don't give him any credit at all. It did not take a genius or an inspired person to come to your senses when you're eating with pigs. In fact, some people would like to say, look at how the Holy Spirit works. No, the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with this. The Holy Spirit has nothing. If the Holy Spirit was involved, the man would have never left the house to begin with. Hello? If the Holy Spirit was involved, he would have never squandered his money to begin with, right? The Holy Spirit at this point can't even be heard. This man came to his senses because he hit rock bottom. Are you hearing me? He hit rock bottom. And this part is so critical because the Holy Spirit isn't even needed when we hit rock bottom like that. And many of you, if you're hitting rock bottom, it's because you have failed to listen to the Spirit speaking to you before you hit. I know of someone who hit a really difficult patch, and I told that person, I said, I can only imagine how many times the Spirit was talking to you. And he said, yes. I can only imagine how many warnings you got. He said, so many. But now, his eyes were open. Now, he sees the light. But it's not because the Holy Spirit just shone over him and everything was illuminated. No, many of us will refuse to learn things the easy way. We must learn the hard way. This is what makes life so challenging. God wants us to learn the easy way. Want to know why? Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Take my burden upon you, because my yoke is what? Easy, and my burden is what? Anybody ever tell you that Christianity is easy? Jesus did. My teachings are easy. They're simple. They make sense. Follow them. God always wants us to learn the easy way. We are knuckleheads. We want to learn the hard way. Oh, that might have happened with that person, but not with me. I'm in a different place now. I'm so healed and restored. I'm so aware. I'm so knowledgeable at this point. So although it may look like I'm out of control, it's different with me. How many times do we justify our foolishness just because we read a clever quote on Instagram? Now we're all knowing. Won't happen to me. 
Let me share this with the rest of the world so people will know exactly how smart I am. And God is sitting back there saying, all right, y'all want to hang with pigs, hang with pigs. That's why the Bible says he does not throw pearls among what? God will not waste his time. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. God just knows that the rock, the hard place, is going to be your teacher. He realizes at this point the pearls aren't going to work, and he's going to let the rock do what the rock does best. I'm not talking about WWE, but I should be, right? You smell what the rock is cooking, right? Some of y'all don't even get that. But this is so important because this is what we need to realize. God will use our circumstances to also be a good teacher. I love what Paul is dealing with in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There's a young man who's bragging at the church about being in an incestuous relationship. And Paul is like, he's emailing them back like, I can't believe y'all are even tolerating this. And they're all, it's all good, grace, 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 and we just love everybody. Yeah, he's acting a little crazy, but it's all good. We're just a good community. And Paul says, you need to take that guy and toss him out of the church. This is what Paul says, his exact words. Throw him to Satan and let Satan have his way with his flesh so that his spirit might be saved. Now, I know for Adventists, that's a really tough text. We're like, what do they mean by spirit? But what, but what Paul is dealing with is redemptive. He's saying this, let him go. If he wants to act like this, he says not even the pagans act this crazy. But if he wants to act like this, let him go. Let him spend some time with the enemy, like straight up, unfiltered time with the enemy and see how the rock bottom feels. And then maybe he'll come to his senses. That's what Paul's saying. And his spirit will be restored. Sometimes we will not learn things the easy way. And let me tell you something. This is going to shock some of you. I believe this is why God allowed the great controversy, the battle between God and Satan to unfold the way that it did. There was no way that God was reaching Lucifer's heart any longer. You want to do things your way? Yeah, do things my way. I don't, I don't, we don't need your rules and laws and we're smart. Trust us to do our own thing. Trust us to be our individualistic way, ourself. Trust us to be who you designed us to be. We don't need you looking over our shoulder. We don't need a parent. All right? Do what you must. One third of heaven follows him. He even gets Adam and Eve to vote for them in the election. They choose to give their allegiance to him. What does the world look like when Satan is the ruler? Anybody? We're experiencing it right now. Don't be mad at God. This is what he was trying to get us to avoid back in the day. But watch this, watch this. So Satan is doing things his own way, and people will say, we just need more and more freedom, more and more freedom. Do you know that God is actually fighting for our freedom? Satan is telling us that we need more freedom. All religion is going to do is, is give you more rules, give you more restrictions, give you more boundaries, and try to keep you contained and controlled. What you need is to be trusted. And these young people are like, yeah, that's right. Now you're talking, pastor. Give me my share and let me bounce. Right now, if we told our kids, it's your choice. What do you want to do? You want to be here or you want to be somewhere else? You don't even want to know the answer, do you? Well, because they look so precious and cute up here, right? And they sang so beautifully and they spoke so glowingly about pathfinders and adventurers. But if you were to give your children all the autonomy right now, there would be no more vegetables or bedtime and only recess and no schoolwork, right? If we gave them autonomy. But what would happen if you allowed your children to make the decisions don't have to brush your teeth anymore. You don't need to take any showers. You do you. What would eventually happen? Teeth would start rotting. They start walking into the walls because they're so tired. 
They start asking for things that you were already giving to them. Now they're saying, please, I'm so sorry. Many of us have to learn the hard way. And the Bible says that this young man, he gets it. He comes to his senses. He's like, okay, it makes sense to me now. But watch what happens here. And this is what's so backwards. He says to himself in uh, uh, Luke 17, I mean, sorry, chapter 15, verse 17. How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Question again, is the Holy Spirit involved in this? Is the Holy Spirit involved in this confession? Can't be, because he's saying, I'll go back as a slave. Not as a son, I'll go back as a servant. I'll go work my, my way back. I'll work my way into my father's affection again. I'll work my way back into his household. I'll work my way back into the ranking of son. This still has nothing to do with the spirit. Many of us, even when we come back to the Lord, come back for selfish reasons. We're still not coming back for the right reasons. We're coming back because we're hungry. Straight up, we're hungry, we need some money. We come back because we're lonely. Straight up, just lonely. We're coming back because we're afraid of being lost. That's it. It's not because we know the Father. It's not because we've been touched by grace. Why is this so critical, family? I believe that what God is willing to give in this parable to his son is exactly what God was giving to Satan. I believe that Satan had his opportunity on this earth to try out his government and see how it works. And I believe that even as he was trying out his government, I believe that grace still had an opening for him. Oh, I know this is tough. I know this is tough. Dr. Schubert, you're going to look at me. You're going to be like, nope, after the sermon, we're talking. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Because Satan did not fall, according to Scripture, until the cross. That's Bible. He did not fall out of heaven until the cross. He still had access to God and all of all the angels until the cross. I believe, as the Bible says in, 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 uh, uh, in, uh, in Colossians chapter 1, 19 and 20, that through Jesus' death, through the shedding of his blood, everything was reconciled, whether on earth or in heaven. Something happened at the cross that, that crystallized everybody's mind. And I'm telling you, I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised. I would be willing to bet something on it that if Satan in this moment at Calvary had a heart that was converted, that what Jesus was willing to give to us he would have also given to him. Now, I know, no, 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 don't, don't be angry. Don't be angry. Don't call the conference yet. I know that we have in our literature that Satan's sin was different because he sinned in the presence of God and, and he had seen all of God's character and still, and still uh, decided to abandon and rebel. I understand that. But can I say something? There is no clear revelation of God's character and his love than Calvary itself. I believe that even in that moment when Satan was watching, he was shocked. Wait, I just knew that if I did this to you, you would really reveal yourself as being a tyrant and an and a, and a arbitrary God. But you're still the same? The young man goes back home not even knowing who the father is. And I'm telling you right now, I believe that Satan and all of us who follow him in one way or another don't know who the father is. Many of us who sing hymns and praise God and get all excited still don't know who the father is. Some of us are in it because of nostalgia. We're in it because we're afraid what will happen if we're not. We're in it because we just want food. We're in it because we want money. But we're not in it for the Father. 
We're not in it to know him. We're not in it to be loved by him. We're not in it to love him. Verse 20 says, so he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. Family, do you think that God has compassion for Satan? Do you think he has compassion for Satan? Do you think he has compassion for Judas? Does he have compassion for you? This was really critical. Remember who Jesus' audience is. He's speaking to tax collectors, who, I mean, speaking to the Pharisees who don't believe that Christ should be hanging out with tax collectors. And what's so important is that Christ is trying to demonstrate the most awful, most offensive thing anyone could do to their father. He's choosing this young man who basically says to his dad, I wish you were dead so I can have your money because that's all I care about. I don't want to take care of you, Dad. I don't want to have any responsibilities for you. Just die already and give me what I deserve. Everyone listening to Jesus is incensed right now with this young man. This young man is like a devil. But the Bible says that the father sees him coming from a long way out. Now watch this. For the father to see his son coming from a far way out means he was waiting, looking for his son. Now, what's different about this parable compared to the other two is that the father never goes looking for his son. The father never goes looking for his son the way the woman looked for the coin and the way the shepherd looked for the lost sheep. Why is that? Why is that? You guys ready? The son knew his way back home. The son knew his way back home. The only responsibility the father had was to keep the door open. There are people in this congregation right now that think your job is to go looking for your children, go looking for that person in your household that you know is lost. I'm telling you right now, not everybody is lost. They just don't want to be home. Hello? And we need to understand when it is appropriate for us to do nothing but wait and keep the doors unlocked. I believe this is exactly what was happening between God and Satan. God had the doors open. At one point was even willing to allow Lucifer after he had deceived, after he had been lying, after he had been doing all that dirt, said, you can have your position back as covering cherub. The door is open. It's Lucifer who says, I don't want to go in. I'm out. Many of you who are in relationships and wanting to be reconciled, you think it's your responsibility to send more scriptures to that, that, that wayward spouse. Oh, the Bible does say in Ephesians, if you can stop. They read the same Bible you've read. They've been in the same church that you've been in. You quoting scripture isn't going to convert them or change their minds. Let them go. Your responsibility is not to coerce them into coming back. Your responsibility is to be a good person, to be a good husband, to be a good wife, to be a good mother, to be a good father, to be a good neighbor. Your responsibility is to continue to work on your character and be who God has called you to be. If that person chooses to return, praise God. But if they choose not to, that's not your responsibility. People know their way back home. They just don't want to go home. The father sees him from a far way out, and the Bible says that the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son. This is so undignified. Men in this culture did not run. Especially fathers, they did not run. If you ran, you, you exposed your ankles and part of your legs. No. You come to me. 
the father was overcome with joy. And he runs to his son. The neighborhood already knows what's going on. They know all the, they, they, they have, this all over social media. They know what this young man has done. And now he's coming back. The Bible tells us he has no clothes. He has no shoes. He smells like pigs. Neighbors are pointing. Oh, there he is. Oh, what a wretch. Oh, I hope he gets beat. Don't just give him a time out. You better get him, daddy. The father comes running. Oh, he's going to get him. He's going to get him. You know he must be mad. Father's running. He's trying to get to his son so he can cover him up. He's trying to get to his son so he can assure him. The Bible says that, that he threw his arms around him and began to kiss him. Oh, my baby boy. Oh, my baby boy. Oh, Daddy, so happy you're, you're here. I just missed you so much. Oh, oh, I love, oh, I love you. And the son, he starts into his speech. Dad, wait, wait, no, hold on, Dad, stop. Dad, stop. Wait a second, I'm a mess. Don't touch me. Wait a second. Okay, um, I prepared something. I am not deserving to be your son anymore. I've sinned against you and against heaven. I've been a bad, bad boy. Dad says, I don't want to hear any of this. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Bible says he takes the ring off his finger and places it on his son's hand. I know, this is not an Adventist, but <laughs> the ring signified, the ring signifies that he's a part of the family. Puts the ring on his finger. He says, you are, you are my son. You're no servant. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. What the son wants to do is fair. I've lost your money, I am now willing to pay you back. Is that fair? It's fair. The father in this moment should be a little bit more responsible. I am going to give you the, the responsibility of earning back the money. This will help teach you a lesson in every other neighborhood kid will know that if you run away like this and disrespect your parents, that this is what's in store for you. So for the whole sake of the community, I am going to set the bar. Yes, son, you can serve me. This is why servanthood existed in these days. So people could earn, they could, they could pay off their debt. That's why there were slaves slash servants, the same Greek word for servant and slave. That's why they existed in Jesus' day so they could earn their way. They could pay off their debt. The son is simply saying, I know that even as a servant in your household, you're so good that I will live better as a lowly servant than out on the streets by myself. But this is what we have to understand here, family. Grace isn't fair. Nor is grace just we keep thinking that God is trying to give us something that we probably deserve no you don't get to earn grace you don't get to earn his love there is nothing that you contribute that makes God go oh bring it in God saw you a far way off and ran to you he said, Daddy, I'm going to get to them. I'm going to get to them, Daddy. I'm going to get to them. All right, all right. I'm going to put on my baby clothes. And he comes all the way to planet Earth to embrace you and wrap his arms around you, to clothe you with his righteousness. John tells us at the beginning of his gospel that Jesus' purpose in coming here is so that he can adopt us. I'm telling you right now, family, grace isn't fair. It will never be fair. In fact, grace, if it doesn't make you a little angry, then you don't understand grace. Grace should make you a little angry to the point where you say, she don't deserve that, and neither does he. 
Grace should make you feel so uncomfortable that you feel like you ought to do something to make up for it. But that's grace. It literally means unmerited favor. This boy is embraced by his father, the Bible says. He says, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the, bring the fattened calf uh, and, and kill it. Let the, let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. So they begin to celebrate. They begin to celebrate. This is what grace looks like it is reckless to some it's extravagant to others it might appear wasteful because the same amount of grace that the father bestows upon this son is the same grace he would give even if his son said thank you dad and walked away jesus died for people that will never want to be his friend the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 that while we were his enemies, while we were still powerless, while we were lost, while we were dead in our sins, that's when Jesus came to die for us. While we were lost, while we were his enemies, this is what Jesus did. Paul says if this is what he does for us while we hate him, how much more will he save us now that we've been made friends through his death? I know what you're going to tell me right now, but pastor, pastor, listen, there are certain things that you can do that really sets off the Holy Spirit, and, and, and God will just, he'll finally say, no more, no more love, no more mercy. Absolutely not. There is never a point, not one point in any history, in the past, in the future, no point in all of our existence where God will ever stop being merciful, where he'll ever stop being gracious. He can't stop being who he is. He's just a good, good father. Call him reckless. Say he's a prodigal. But God is recklessly in love with you. And he'll move heaven and earth to get to you. And he wants to cover you up and shower you with kisses. I don't write the script. It's in the word. That's why Romans 5 tells us where sin increases, grace all the more. Oh, you don't hear me this morning. Listen, wait, 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 wait. I'm going to say it in a way that you'll be offended. You cannot out -sin God's grace. You can never be so bad that he's not good. Oh, let me, oh no, no, no. Make sure you understand this. You can never do anything where grace will not cover you can never be so bad that God says, well, you're just too bad. He's a good, good father. It's who he is. He's a prodigal. But he's a prodigal for you, for me. And he will move heaven and earth ten times over if it means he gets you in the end. Come home. It's not scary. Nothing to be afraid of. You think you, he's going to be afraid of your wounds? He has wounds of his own. You think he's going to be afraid because you're unhealthy? You're toxic. That's why he came. He's looking down that road waiting for you to come down. Family, I preached this series just to get to the Father. I preached this series not to, not to talk about the Good Shepherd or the the good mom or housewife who looks for her lost coin. No, that's basic. The parable that Christ was ramping up for is this one. That's why it's much longer than the others. Christ is getting to the good, good father. He wants everyone to know, all of those who, did, who look in disdain of why would Jesus do it? It's so unfair. It's so unfair. 
But Jesus looks at us, he says, I know it's unfair because sin is unfair. Sin is unfair. So grace must also be unfair. So come on, bring it in. I'm a good, good father. It's who I am. I kept the door open for Satan. I kept the door open for Judas, for Pete. Not everybody trusts me to come in through that door again, but I kept the seat warm for all of them, even my enemies. I love them, love them. Love them, love them. Church family, I want you to think about the words of this song. I want you to think about where you are right now and why you've decided to be here in this church. Because if you're here for any other reason than the good father, I'm telling you, you haven't been called by the right reasons. You haven't been motivated by the right reasons. He's a good, good father.